The Unshackled Waves, episode 166. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Many Australians are concerned about the continued Islamic immigration to our nation. A poll in 2016 found 49% of Australians wanted a ban on Muslim immigration. Given that Australia already has a significant Muslim minority at 2.6% of the population at the time of the last census, we have already seen the effects of that Islamization has had here. This includes child marriage, uh, female genital mutilation, and the forms of Sharia law being practiced here. One form of Islamization that has been heavily scrutinized is that of halal certification. Halal in Arabic means permissible and applies to food and drink consumed by Muslims. Muslims not, must not consume pork, alcohol or blood. The demand for halal food has created a large halal certification industry with many Muslims bec uh, becoming uh, halal certifiers and the profits are going to funding some questionable uh, Islamic projects. One person who has been a voice on all of these issues for a number of years is Kira Lee Smith. She founded the consumer information website Halal Choices and has been a spokesperson for the Q Society and has been a candidate for the Australian Liberty Alliance and has recently joined Australian Conservatives. So Kira Lee joins us today to discuss her activism. Kira Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, you're described as an anti-Islam activist, which is, it's probably not the right term. Uh, Islam critical is probably the way that you and uh, I think others prefer to describe ourselves. Absolutely. Definitely. And a conservative through and through. Your journey to sort of waking up to the, the influence of uh, Islam, it, it came no, not through uh, just uh, watching the news, observing um, Australia per se, but you actually did some Christian mission work uh, overseas. Can you describe that? Sure. So I did a Bachelor of Theology uh, in the late 90s and um, then got married and my husband and I had the opportunity to travel quite extensively. But we did spend uh, a good month in Mali in northwest Africa, which has a very strong um, Islamic influence there. Um, and it's only grown stronger in the last 18 years since we've been there. Uh, but we got to spend that time with an ex-Shiite Muslim of Lebanese descent uh, who had really he's really lived the full experience of. Um, of both Islam and Christianity. And uh, we did some other traveling. I've also been to Israel and Turkey, but it was in Indonesia in 2002 where we visited the refugee camps after the jihad that went through the, it started in Ambon and went up through the Maluku Islands. And meeting thousands of refugees, both Muslim and Christian, was where I was so confronted with the reality, uh, the harsh reality of jihad, of what Islam in its, uh, it, what the capacity that it has to harm and just be so damaging to a country and to a people. Uh, I guess ever since then I felt broken, but committed to being a voice for these people because every single one of them that I met in every country who has suffered has held my hands and said, please remember me and please tell my story. And it's important to distinguish between the, the ideology of Islam and uh, individual uh, Muslims because uh, often we're, we're called uh, Islamophobes, but we don't dislike the, the, the people uh, who follow uh, Islam because, as you mentioned just before, they're uh, just as much a, a victims of this ideology as uh, people who have been in the West. Absolutely correct. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had many meals, sat with Muslim people, cried with Muslim people. Um, the, every person on earth to me is valuable and precious and has uh, an innate value and worth just because they are human beings. But just as I really dislike the ideology of Islam, it's the same. I really dislike Nazism. I really dislike communism. But I can still uh, respect and value the individual, but I can be very, very against their ideas. And I think that's an important separation and a clear distinction that we make, uh, that's something that is quite common for conservatives or liberals to make, but it's the... Um, you know, it's the left side of politics that likes that identity and wrap it all up together and say that you can't separate it. Well, you absolutely can, and I absolutely do. 
Yeah. It's like I say, I've, I've met uh, plenty of communists who are, are nice people, they're, they're lovely human beings, but I don't want communism. I think it's a, a horrible uh, system of government. Absolutely. Now, you're described as the, the accidental activist, which uh, if it was an accident, you've been pretty uh, good at it because in your media appearances, you're always very professional. You, you put your arguments forward well. Now, obviously, the, the organization that you founded was Halal Choices, which right. now there's heaps of different uh, problems that Islamization brings, but you chose to, to focus on uh, Halal, which... Uh, which uh, I'll get you to first explain what uh, specifically halal is. Most people know it as uh, to do with the, the slaughter of animals uh, properly, but there's a bit more to it than that. Yeah, definitely. Halal as a term simply means permissible under Sharia. Sharia is the way, the, the, um, the law that governs uh, a Muslim person's life. So it's, it's all the laws of Islam under that title called Sharia. Halal simply means permissible or lawful. Whereas haram means, you know, it's unlawful or it's not permissible. So uh, halal usually is associated with things like food or consumables, but it can be applied to marriage, travel, relationships, you name it, uh, whether it's good, lawful or permissible. So I'll turn to you now what uh, uh, pricked your interest with uh, halal uh, specifically. Yeah, well, I did all that travel, as I said, um, a long time ago, uh, not long after I did my uh, university degree. Uh, then I started fostering kids and we ended up having our own children and uh, the opportunity to, well, I thought, to actually do anything had long passed. Um, my husband, was he still is an avid reader and goes to conferences and things like that. And, and a, a conference came to our little town about Islam. I went along. Uh, the speaker there, uh, you know, like one paragraph out of, you know, all Friday night, all day Saturday and half of Sunday, one paragraph that he spoke on was about halal certification. But as a housewife, as a mum, I thought, oh, well, that's possibly something I could look into. I could avoid halal certified foods if I uh, looked into it. Uh, within a week, I was stomping my feet. I was realising there is no list. This is really bizarre. And started to uncover even that early some corruption or things that didn't actually add up and so this is where the accident or accidental activist comes in i'm you know i would have been one of those very annoying kids that was always saying it's not fair it's not fair because justice is a very core value for me and so as i'm realizing there's so much misinformation here and it doesn't really make sense it's not fair so um especially to consumers at that point I just, with my friends, decided to do some research. I kept talking to them about it. They're going, put it online. We all want this information. If you get a shopping list, give us a shopping list. And so uh, after about 10 months of very uh, consuming research, again, accidentally, it was just, it was really getting under my skin. We put it online under the uh, title of Halal Choices because we want people to have information so they can make an informed choice about their grocery purchases. And it went berserk. Within a week, with no advertising, without anything, we had about 3,000 views of the website. And within a year, it was um, consistently 100,000 views. So wow. we, we wow. realised, wow, this is something that a lot of people are very concerned about. And I will say, I think particularly for Aussies, uh, we are so laid back and we are so, uh, you know, we give everyone a go. We're, we're, we're like that. And that that's the beauty of Australians. But where something really hits us in our back pocket, in the wallet, we do tend to, you know, back up a little bit and go, hang on a minute, I'm not going to be ripped off here. I don't want um, to pay for things I don't need to pay for. And so, whereas a lot of Australians, particularly back in 2011, weren't really prepared to have uh, a conversation about Islam and the difficulties of Sharia in Australia, they were more than happy to say, I am not funding uh, or promoting a religion that I, I don't know about or I don't agree with. So I think that's been part of the key to success, but it was never a strategy that I set out to achieve. It was literally something that I went, this just seems really wrong. And my, all of my suspicions have been confirmed as time has gone on and, and with the research I've done. And it's not just uh, meat uh, that uh, halal certification applies to, which well, that's what most people would assume. There's a uh, chocolate is halal certified and even Vegemite, which, how does that work? Well, look, 
we're told um, by halal certifiers that they're getting paid a fee to state the obvious. Basically, that's my paraphrasing of it, that there is nothing in that product that is haram, which means there's no blood, uh, carry on, uh, pork um, and alcohol in those products. But why someone has to pay a fee to state the obvious, uh, you know, just is beyond me. And it's unnecessary. And so it's not just food or consumable products like you've mentioned. I mean, there's breads, there's uh, milk, there's all of those things, but there's also things like toilet paper and feminine hygiene products and nail polish and makeup and vaccines. Like it's gone on and on to the point now where even transport can be certified halal, that this truck has never carried anything, you know, that has pork or alcohol or something in it. It just... It just rolls on and on and on. To to me, it just seems absurd. And it's a big money-making scheme, very profitable, very successful. Is this video call Halal Certified? <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> now, that's been the other part of your work, following the, the money trail, because all these companies, they pay a fee to these Halal Certifiers to basically give their their stamp uh, of approval. It, it, it works the same as other uh, food certifications such as the Heart Foundation who give, who give their tick to uh, cer uh, certain products. Uh, but most of these, it's, it's very hard to see where the, the money goes from these halal uh, certifiers. Uh, a lot of, a lot, or it's, it seems to me, why would, if it's, if it's for the, the benefit of Muslim consumers, why would you aim to make money out of it? Wouldn't it be just a, a, a service? They, they, a lot of these people say the profits go to schools and, and mosques. Is, is that all there is, or have you found other things? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you've just put so much in that little package there. I'll unpack it a little bit. But yep. first of all, to say uh, it might have similarities to organic or heart tick or some of those, except when somebody pays for a heart tick, they make sure they put it on the label so the consumer knows that they've paid that fee and it's part of their marketing strategy. With Halal, it's usually hidden. That's why I started Halal Choices, because of the 500 companies uh, plus that I contacted in that first year, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products that were halal certified, but it was not indi indicated on the label or on the website at all. Yet, they're paying a fee, you would think, to market their product to Muslims and not letting anyone know about it. So that was one of the indications there's something very wrong here. Uh, in addition to that, yes, um, the there's two kinds of halal certifiers. There's uh, private business, which are obviously in it to make money, as every private business is in business for. Then you've got the uh, religious uh, side of things, such as the mosques or Islamic uh, organisations or associations that are, are conducting halal certification. And they are quite open. Uh, you can see it on all of their websites. The profits of halal certification do go to funding their mosques, their Islamic schools and Islamic charities. Now, on the surface, some people might go, oh, I don't have a problem with that. Well, good on you. But I do because I don't want to fund the promotion of Sharia. I know what's taught in mosques. I've read the Quran and some of the Hadiths. I've uh, studied it. I've seen firsthand the effects of Sharia on people's lives. Uh, I know that it is very oppressive to women and to children and to Christians and to Jews and to other minority groups, to gays. And, um, you know, as a consumer, I do not want any part of my money going to fund the promotion of such things. Islamic charities is another whole issue where it has certainly been, um, you know, the Australian Crime Commission, the Austrac, the uh, Institute of Criminology, all say that one of the top three ways of funding terror is through Islamic charities. And uh, we know that Islamic certifiers, uh, sorry, halal certifiers um, are quite open about how much money they give to these charities. And so uh, there's a lot of suspicion. It's never been fully investigated. Where does the money end up? Well, if it ends up in charities and then in the hands of someone like Hamas, I definitely don't want anything to do with that. Yeah, it's not as explicit as uh, the, these uh, uh, charity certifiers giving money to ISIS, for example. It's the, the money gets shifted around and it's more, more to do with uh, funding what, uh, what we would consider extremist organisations. Absolutely. Um, like I said, and that's most definitely a concern and what, what uh, sparks a lot of interest for people. But even, like I said, I just roll it right back and say, I don't want my money. I don't. I don't see why 
the average Australian with their everyday grocery purchases needs to be funding mosques or Islamic schools or Islamic charities. If you want to, just like the Salvos stand out there and have their, you know, they rattle the tin. If you want to give to the Salvos, you give to the Salvos. I do not want to promote Sharia, so I'm not going to give to any Islamic causes. That's my right and my choice in a democratic country. Well, some have said that uh, with your uh, halal choices, you're, you're being quite uh, pedantic when uh, I've, I think one of the uh, companies that said their products were halal sort of certified said that when you uh, purchase something that's halal certified, it's less than uh, one cent that's, that's going to the, the certifiers. And so it's uh, uh, in, insignificant. There's very few companies that will actually disclose the full amount that they pay. Now, there is certainly some examples where it is quite minimal and uh, that, that's definitely uh, for sure. However, uh, with the Senate inquiry in 2015, uh, there was a lot of evidence produced uh, from meat companies, from abattoirs, from uh, the Islamic certifiers themselves, where we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in fees. Uh, for halal certification, um, tens of thousands in the, uh, you know, I use this example of the chicken industry, 5% of all our chicken in Australia that's processed goes overseas for export. So we can immediately cut out the export argument. Uh, but some of these chicken companies are paying 30, 40, 50 grand a year for halal certification and they are full-time employing uh, slaughterers to they don't do anything. The machines kill chickens in Australia. So few chickens are hand slaughtered, it's not funny. The machines are there. So any mechanic could look after the machinery, but there are full time uh, people employed there to pray. They must have their own separate prayer rooms. Uh, and you're talking about, you know, a full time wage here. So we are talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars that chicken companies are, are paying to be halal certified. Now, you can't tell me that a company is going to absorb those costs. If they want to be profitable, they will pass that cost on to the consumer. Wow, that's very <laughs> elaborate, uh, uh, le uh, learning about the, the full extent. Now, the other criticism that's uh, levied at you is the, the practicality of boycotting everything that's halal certified because, like you said, there is uh, so much. And uh, th uh, I watched that Four Corners episode where you were in the supermarket with the uh, reporter and uh, uh, going through all the products. And some people would say, look, if you're living your life by avoiding all of that, you're, you're not going to have much to purchase. It's the same with these corporations who are engaged in, in social uh, justice issues. Like, yep, these uh, corporations may do things things that you, you disagree with, but if you're going to ba basically live your life through making political purchases, it's, it, it's too excessive. Look, and for some people that may be, and that's okay, but for me and my family, uh, it, these are important statements that we're making, but that's also why I call the website Halal Choices, to give people a choice. Um, We've not just listed the halal certified foods, but the foods or the products that declare they are not paying halal certification fees. So you have that option, that choice, if you want to make that choice. Uh, the other benefit, again, just personally and health wise, is it's mostly uh, processed foods that are halal certified. And yes, the meat, um, but I, we avoid processed foods. So we're a lot healthier, a lot happier, and we're not <laughs> funding those companies. But I will say, again, you know, we, we live in a very complex society now and, and I don't know where you draw the line, but if you don't have accurate information, you cannot draw the line. And so all I've attempted to do with my website and my activism is to show and to give information to each consumer so they can make their own choice. I've actually never orchestrated a boycott of any company. Uh, we've given information to consumers. If that's what their choice is, that's what their choice is. But that has not been something that I've been behind or orchestrated. It's simply uh, giving out that information. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good approach to, to take. Now, uh, obviously, uh, since you began this uh, activism, you have uh, copped quite an amount of uh, criticism and uh, abuse and I would assume threats as well and you you were also uh, sued you and the Q Society by one of the Islamic certifiers Muhammad al Uh now obviously there was uh, a settlement so so you can't uh, go into too much detail about that but that would have been quite a uh, difficult experience to go through Oh, absolutely. Well, before that happened, yes, um, we did receive death threats and uh, 
our family chose to move and to become silent electors and those sort of things, just to take precautions. I won't be intimidated and I won't back down because people threaten me, but I will obviously be sensible in the way I conduct myself and my, my family's safety in those things. Um, so, so that was hard in itself, but then to um, go through a two year Supreme Court in New South Wales case um, to defend defamation claims against us, was more stressful and difficult than most people will ever know or that I need to talk about. It was extremely costly. At the end of the day, we didn't pay anything except our late legal fees, which did total over $600,000. And uh, I am a tradies wife who lives on the you know mid north coast of New South Wales. That that is an astronomical amount of money. Uh, the Q Society were absolutely amazing. And so were all of our supporters who helped raise and cover most of that. But, you know, here we are a year and a half down the track and our family will be paying the price for that for many, many years to come. It's difficult. But again, I I, I feel so called uh, to keep speaking out on these issues and I will do what I can to highlight and bring awareness to Australians about what's going on. And of course, uh, in the end, uh, Mohammed al Mahay he had somewhat of a downfall when it was exposed. He was... Uh, saying uh, online that uh, strain women needed to be uh, f fertilized by Muslim men. I mean, how did it make you feel when, when that came out? Um, yeah, I mean, I can't comment too much, but he, he, he made his own bed, put it that way, you know. Uh, he, 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 he get enough rope. Well, what else can I say? He, he spoke his own words, nobody could misconstrue them. They couldn't be understood, misunderstood so people could judge him for, for who he is and what he says. And I think the Australian people have done that. Now, obviously that was a difficult experience, but you have had some victories. Uh, Kellogg's and Sanitarium, they withdrew their Halal uh, certification and you were successful in getting a, uh, helped get a Senate inquiry up into uh, f a third party uh, food uh, certification, which uh, helped put scrutiny on the, the Halal certification uh, industry. Absolutely. I'm really proud of the work that I and others around me have done when it comes to the halal industry. We, uh, you know, you've mentioned uh, Kellogg's and um, I don't know who you mentioned. But Sa sanitarium. And sanitarium, correct. Um, there's There's been a lot more, you know, Nestle have removed it from their chocolates, uh, their chocolate range, still have it on other products. Majura Tea decided to not go down that track. Um, none of those companies will obviously will attribute it to me or to uh, any of these factors, but we know that this is where uh, we've put enough uh, awareness in people's minds. We've created enough of a stir and a conversation that companies do think twice about paying those fees or renewing this certification that they have. And the 2015 Senate inquiry was incredibly successful. Uh, more than 1,400 submissions were made by the public and by organisations. We had three days of hearings. All of them confirmed uh, our concerns all the way along. The only issue now that remains is that despite the fact there was bipartisan agreement on the recommendations, the government are just too gutless and incompetent and unwilling to implement those recommendations. But I am not backing down on that either. I now have the HAM campaign, which is the Halal Action Movement. Uh, we've got over 15,000 signatures and supporters on that campaign. And we will I will be taking that to um, Senator Cory Bernardi in the coming months and getting some other politicians on board to ensure that the government does its duty. We have all of these ridiculous inquiries that are so expensive, hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars, many days and weeks spent on these inquiries, and so few, not, not just this inquiry, but so few of these inquiries actually see the light of day. Well, um, I'm not gonna back down with this one. I'm going to see it through and make sure that the government is held to account. Now, in my, uh, you've mentioned your, your new campaign. I tried to access the Halal Choices website and it was uh, offline. Do you have a new website? Yeah, look, there's just some technical difficulties, but we do have the www.hamcampaign.com.au, uh, which that's specifically for the petition and the campaign. Halal Choices will be back up, I hope, next week. Uh, that's where you've got the search engine to find the, uh, the product lists. And we'll link to uh, that website on the on the show notes page.
Now, uh, obviously, you're most well known uh, for your views on Islam and halal, but there's more to Kira Lee Smith than, than that, and you've gotten uh, politically active uh, as well. You were the, the lead Senate candidate for the Australian Liberty Alliance in 2016 in, in New South Wales. Why did you decide to make that step from activist to running for parliament? Uh, there was a number of reasons, but primarily, you know, uh, Petitioning the politicians through the halal choices uh, opened my eyes and I got to see how some of the political process worked and working alongside Q Society for many years, uh, their transition was that we had been trying from the outside to influence politics. We feel that uh, times are changing far too rapidly and something needs to happen from the inside. So um, I, I did say, I'll just make this statement because I know you're going to talk about Australian Conservatives as well in this, that. Uh, Corey Bernardi was one of the senators who was open and agreeable and active uh, with the halal choices uh, all along. And so I'd always said, if Corey ever goes, leaves the Liberals, I'm there because I'd, I've lost faith in the Liberal Party a long, long time ago. Um, so I did join Australian Liberty Alliance under that proviso and condition that if Corey ever went out on his own, I would follow. Um, I'm really proud of the campaign that ALA and myself ran with Bernard Gaynor and um, Debbie Robinson and others in 2016. And we certainly got issues on the table that I don't believe would have been on the table otherwise. Uh, but I just feel uh, now that um, uh, like politics is broken. It's such a mess and we all need to be a voice however we can be. So I was given a platform. Too many people kept saying to me, please, you are speaking common sense. You're a voice for us. Uh, I feel like it was part of my responsibility to, to my supporters to actually throw my hat in the ring. And are you confident with uh, Australian Conservatives? I mean, there's, they're, they've run in a few by-elections. There was the South Australian election result. Uh, a lot of people uh, are doubting uh, its ability. How are you feeling about Australian Conservatives? Look, I think the whole system, as I said, is broken and I think that it's really difficult to predict anything in politics these days and, as you know, it can change overnight. Uh, I think Australian Conservatives are very well positioned uh, with Corey as a leader. He's got, you know, a decade or more experience in the Senate itself, 30 years uh, prior with the Liberal Party. He's measured, he's sensible, he's very articulate. Uh, he's a good leader and we have a good grassroots movement. I think those by-elections are not good indications of what will happen in a federal election for a lot of complex reasons. Uh, I think with the resources and the exposure that Australian Conservatives have, with the quality of people that we've attracted, I think we've got a, a really good opportunity to make a difference and to, um, to hold the major parties to account and to make sure that the issues that we're really concerned about are constantly addressed from all sides. Now, uh, as we established at the beginning, you're uh, a Christian and uh, we've spoken uh, quite a bit of the show about the, the role of uh, one uh, religion uh, in Australia. So I'm curious, uh, given your personal faith, um, how do you see the, the relationship between Christianity and the state? Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if you've discussed this on the show already, but usually that division of church and state came about because it was more about not letting the government get involved in the church rather than the other way around. Um, personally, and I can only speak for myself, not for all Christians, but my view of Christianity and God is that one of his core values is freedom. He doesn't um, impose or compel people to follow him. He, again, gives them choices. And so I, as a Christian, I think that's my responsibility is, again, just to spread the information, to give people the opportunity and uh, to make their own choice at the end of the day, but not to compel anyone, whereas it's quite different um, in my understanding when it comes to Islam and, and the like. So I think when you look at what Christianity has achieved in Western nations with the Judeo-Christian ethic and values and the basis, when you look at things like education and the amount of schools and service that Christians have given to the community. Hospitals are so often uh, founded and run um, through uh, Christian organisations. Uh, we, we have contributed so much to Western culture that makes it wonderful and great. So there's that service side of things and there's the defending freedom side of things that are really important to me and that's the expression of my faith in what I do. 
Now, uh, as we also mentioned in the beginning, you did Christian uh, mission work. So obviously you believe in Christian service. And so you believe that Christianity should play uh, a big role in the, the wider Australian community. Um, well, I mean, that's a matter of for individuals and for, for each church, I guess, to make. But but service is definitely the key for me. You know, everything we did overseas was volunteering our time to build homes, hospitals, uh, schools for, for people who didn't have the ability to do that for themselves and to visit those refugees and to comfort them and to bring hope where we could. So in Australia, I would love to see the church or Christians um, have the attitude of how can we serve? How can we uh, be a, a blessing, I guess, to this nation. And uh, th that's, I'm just doing what I can from my position. Now, a lot of, obviously, a lot of Christians even accuse me of not being a Christian because I'm quite uh, aggressive in my defense of Western values. Uh, but again, you know, Jesus turned tables, he did all of those sort of things. So I don't have a problem with being very assertive and aggressive in uh, defending freedom. Now, you uh, also uh, define yourself as a uh, conservative and uh, obviously at the, the second half of last year was dominated by the, the marriage law postal survey, which you decided to, uh, I'm not sure how much you were involved in. Yeah, so with the no campaign, I wasn't formally connected to anyone in the coalition or, or for, for marriage or anything like that, but I did post... Uh, a picture of myself with the ballot paper with the no vote and that photo attracted over 2 million views and thousands of comments, lots of abuse. And uh, I also did a video around that time uh, called Stop Appropriating My Gender. Now, one of the main reasons I got involved in the campaign and was such a, a vocal uh, presence in that was because I, I don't actually believe the campaign was about love is love. I have uh, gay relatives. I have uh, friends in homosexual relationships. I, I don't have a problem with the choice that you make of what you want to do in your bedrooms. That's fine. I do have a problem when you want to reconstruct society and uh, the institutions that have been so successful for so many years. And I feel that it actually has more to do with the radical gender theories than anything. And that seems to be playing out quite accurately now, this side of things. And I'm keeping a very close eye on all of these gender issues. And I will be focusing even more of my campaigning on those issues because I think that our children and even women are very vulnerable in this whole debate and we need to have a voice and we need to stand up to the bullies, to the harassment, to the vilification that's going on because I do think we have some very valid points that need to be addressed. And obviously, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, uh, posting that ballot paper got you a lot of hate, albeit from a, a different uh, a group. Um, uh, obviously, you're very uh, battle hard, but uh, uh, that, uh, that didn't deter you at all? No, not at all. My husband and I read the comments and have a good old laugh most of the time. And so do my supporters. I share a lot of them because all it does is reinforce and prove to us that we're on the right track, that if all you've got is insults or bullying in an argument, then you've got nothing. It, it's absolutely nothing. It, it's meaningless to me. Uh, I want to hear your reasons for your position. I want to engage on those things. We're not going to necessarily agree at the end of the day. That's okay. But I want a reason debate in these things. So yeah, you, can, you can attack me all you like. It is not going to stop me from putting forward my opinion because it's not just my opinion. There are hundreds of thousands of people who feel the same way. There's millions, in fact, in, Amer in Australia that voted no, and uh, we deserve to be heard in this argument. Uh, you still manage to have a, a smile every time. <laughs> Well, you got to, you know, life's good. We, we live in an amazing country. We have, we do have incredible privilege and I don't subscribe to the whole white privilege thing, but, um, you know, you, you can, you can be down, you can be depressed about everything. I'm not, I, I'm really hopeful. I'm really positive that, that we're right and that we will succeed in the end. And, uh, are there any other concerning trends that, uh, you find, uh, in Australia? Oh, so many. I mean, just look, the umbrella of political correctness, it's, um, I say it's a disease that's infecting everything, whether it's, you know, government, education, healthcare, uh, you name it, um, that PC beast is out of control. And um, I'm refusing to feed it. And I'm not going to, yeah, I'm just, I'm not an appeaser. I'm not an apologist. I won't go there. So I look at the size of government, the size and scope of government. I think it is ridiculous. We are so over-governed. There are so many laws. Uh, like a little example is, you know, we, we go camping with friends and we, we talk about it. it's so absurd that we need, 
you know, you know, you need your driver's license, your car registration, your trailer registration, you have to pay your national park fees, you've got to have a fishing license, you've got to have a fire permit. Like there's just permits and government. Now, some of those things are good and healthy for the society, don't get me wrong, but we're just over governed from that that minute individual level right through to whether it's, yeah, like I said, ed education, healthcare, taxes, way too big. The government has way too much control and I think it's time that we took personal responsibility for our own decisions and acted a lot more civilly in this society, reduced the size and scope of government. And I think that that would have a big effect on this political correct beast that wants to, um, yeah, education is obviously a massive issue for me. I have three young children or three children that uh, are all in uh, a system of sorts. So uh, that's what I'm really passionate about as well. And even though you do call yourself a conservative, there was an interesting uh, Fairfax article that was published which called you a libertarian leader. Now, I come from the libertarian movement myself, and there was a lot of uh, libertarians who weren't pleased with you being labelled that. How, uh, how, how did that article make you feel? Well, I, you know, I made it quite clear to Nick O'Malley that I'm not a libertarian, and I think that's an incorrect label, but journalists do whatever they like to get the headlines and get the stories. So. Um, having said that, I found him. I found the whole article pretty good, considering it was the Sydney Morning Herald and, and where it came from. But um, it, it's an inaccurate label, as are most labels. I just think we can't really be put into a lot of the boxes people want to put us into. Even like, what is the libertarian box? What is the conservative box? I know within the conservative box, there is so many, uh, so much variety in what we actually think and believe and uh, will pursue. So. I really, you know, the labels can be helpful to a point, but they really don't define me or you or anybody else. Well, Kerley, I've appreciated you uh, coming on the show today and uh, me and our audience getting to uh, know you and your work uh, a lot more. Good luck with uh, your future activism and obviously a political uh, aspiration. And thanks again. Thank you, Tim. It was great to be here. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Tickets are still on sale for the big tour by Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axiomatic Events, so to make sure you grab your place, please visit axiomatic.events. Another big name who is coming down later this year is former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage, who's coming in September, and also visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane and Auckland. It's being brought to you by the same people who brought you Milo Live last year and tickets including various VIP passes can be booked by visiting nigellive.com.au. Also, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, then please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. And also don't forget, uh, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise that I wear on the show and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.